Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's Restoring Neighborhoods Task Force meeting. We are going to have a really great presentation for you today, starting with some policy updates, but then diving into a brief discussion about a J.P. Morgan Chase's Pro Neighborhoods Program, and then discussing single-family strategies with presenters from the National Community Stabilization Trust and ACT Housing in Milwaukee. I'm Rebecca King. I'm the Acting Director of Policy at the National Housing Conference, and I will let my colleagues introduce themselves. Hi, this is Caitlin Snyder, also at the National Housing Conference. And I'm David Dworkin, President and CEO of the National Housing Conference. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. And just as a reminder for folks, you can send questions at any time through the chat box, and we are recording the webinar, and we'll make it available um, in our regular follow-up email. Caitlin's going to get started with some policy updates. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, so the biggest thing that folks should be aware of is the budget, and that's for the FY 2019 and FY 2018 budget. So as I'm sure many of you have already seen, the White House released its 2019 budget request in mid-February. Altogether, not just in HUD, but across Treasury um, and a bunch of different federal agencies, it cuts more than $8 billion from programs that invest in the American home. These programs range from home, CDBG, Native Hawaiian Housing Block Grant, the Capital Magnet Fund, the National Housing Trust Fund, CDFIs, the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness, the Neighborhood Reinvestment Corporation, Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, the Weatherization Assistance Program, and the Delta Regional Com Commission. All of those would be completely eliminated. Um, and many other things would be significantly um, cut or maintained at FY 2017 levels, um, but they need a bump up because of inflation. Um, so one thing that I wanted to call out in this, they released an addendum to the budget, um, and it accounts for the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018 that was passed right before they released the president's budget. Um, and so in that addendum, they call for $1.7 billion um, to be used to hold harmless elderly and disabled households in HUD-assisted um, housing. And that was, you saw that in the budget request, they had cut those programs significantly. And then in the addendum, um, they put in $1.7 billion to make sure that those households did not, um, were not affected by the cut. So that's 2019 in a very quick nutshell. Um, and they're not gonna start working on FY 2019 until they finish up FY 2018. Um, and that Congressional Appropriations runs out on March 23rd. So right now in both the House and Senate, they're working to get those bills across the finish line, and then they'll turn to FY19 once they're done with those. Um, and if all of that has your head spinning, I suggest you check out our annual budget forum, which we held a few weeks ago. The recording is available on our website, and we'll make sure that when we send out the notes, we'll include a link for that. So that's Congressional Budget. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Caitlin. Something I wanted to flag for, for folks was that the Federal Housing Finance Agency uh, announced its decision to preserve funding for the housing trust funds. And what I mean by that um, is in recent weeks, FHFA also announced that it would need a draw from Treasury because of the impact of tax reform which devalued Freddie, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's tax deferred assets. So Director Watt has the authority to suspend contributions to the National Housing Trust Fund and the Capital Magnet Fund if he deems that, doing, that continuing contributions would have a negative impact on the financial stability of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. But given the draws were a result of the tax bill and not GSE performance, uh, he has decided the contributions should continue. So for for all of us who use those funds and are deploying those funds, um, that's good news. And then another recent FHFA announcement to share from Caitlin. So they, yesterday they put out a proposed rule um, amending the Federal Home Loans Bank's Affordable Housing Program. It makes a number of changes. Um, probably the most notable is giving the Federal Home Loan Bank's authority to allocate their affordable housing program funds and just kind of changing some of the formulas around that. And then it does some things about streamlining and clarifying requirements. 
Um, so this is an area where NHC has been engaged in and it's continued to remain engaged in. They haven't yet officially published it in the Federal Register. We were thinking it was going to be today, but it looks like it'll be tomorrow. Um, and comments are due 60 days from whenever it's officially published in the Federal Register. So if it's published tomorrow, comments will be due on May 7th. So do pay attention to that. And they are holding a webinar on March 27th. Um, FHFA is hosting the webinar. Um, we'll include information on that in the notes. But if you're interested in understanding the proposal and commenting, um, do plan to participate in that as well. Um, another update to share um, around opportunity zones. Just want to make sure folks um, are aware of this, paying a little bit of attention because of an upcoming deadline. Um, the Treasury Department just last week put out a new resource on Opportunity Zones. As a, as a recap, they were created in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, the Tax Reform Bill. Um, this new resource lists all of the census tracts that are eligible as Qualified Opportunity Zones. So qualified uh, census tracts are either meet the New Markets Tax Credit Program definition or they're contiguous tracts to those um, new market census tracts. So the deadline I referenced is March 21st. That's when governors need to designate opportunity zones in their state or request an extension. And they can request a 30-day extension from Treasury. If they don't request an extension or designate zones, they lose the opportunity to participate in the program. We should note that these designations last for 10 years. So if they miss this deadline or fail to request a deadline, you're missing out for 10 years. Yeah. So while there's still a lot we don't know about Opportunity Zones, it is a new investment vehicle for distressed communities and, and hopefully um, affordable housing. So definitely something to be engaged in at a state level. The last thing we wanted to mention in terms of updates is our solution for housing communications convening. It's coming up on April 17th here in Washington at the National Press Club. Dr. Tiffany Manuel of Enterprise Community Partners is going to be our keynote speaker at the lunch and plenary. And she is going to share some about her research on communicating about gentrification and fair housing. So it's going to be a great presentation from her. We've got a lot of other great panels lined up around communication strategies and tactics for expanding awareness of the benefits of affordable housing. So you don't want to miss it. And the early bird discount ends Friday, like in two days. So take advantage of that. We hope you'll join us. With that, I'm going to turn things over to Merceda Morchazavi with uh, JP Morgan Chase. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Merceda Morchazavi, JP Morgan Chase Global Philanthropy. I'm really excited to be. Um, on the web this webinar and briefly talking about um, the launch of our fifth uh, pro neighborhood CFI collaborative competition RFP. Um, for those of you who, have, who haven't heard of this before, um, partnerships for raising opportunity in neighborhoods or pro neighborhoods for short is our five year 125 million effort to drive inclusive economic growth by helping communities access the tools they need to address neighborhood quality issues that inhibit economic mobility. And our initiative is consistent of three components. One is the annual national competition to support CDFI collaboratives, which is the RFP that just launched. Um, second is to seed grants to support new financing mechanisms that expand affordable housing connected to economic opportunity drivers. And the third is forward-looking data tools that help cities plan their neighborhood investments equitably and efficiently. So I'm going to focus on the RFP um, today because it launched on Monday and it's live on our website right now if you would like to take a look. This year's RFP is open from, um, well it opened until, uh, and it closes on April 20th. And we're really seeking holistic development strategies in which capital plays a key role in connecting vulnerable communities to greater opportunity and advancing a broader strategic vision. Um, so. Specifically, because that's a that's a lot. Um, we're looking for two types of proposals. So planning grants for um, you know communities who don't have a plan in place but are looking to develop a plan that advances equitable development, and capital grant grants for communities who are looking to advance an existing equitable development plan. Um, we're accepting proposals from a very long list of eligible markets that are outlined in our RFP, but we're particularly interested in solutions 
in Atlanta, Broward County, Florida, Central Valley Fresno region, Dallas, Denver, Houston, Las Vegas, Newark, New Orleans, and Wilmington. Um, and if you would like to learn more, we are having um, an informational call with OFN on March 13th from 2 to 3, and I'm happy to send all of this to Rebecca to circulate um, if you're interested. But um, the, the RFP is on our website, and the focus is really on um, connecting to a broader equitable development plan. Um, so I'll pause there and, and see if there um, are any questions, but happy to answer anything via email and send all of this information out as well. Thanks, Mercedes. And if you want to have questions now, you can send them in the chat box. Um, if not, we will send out links as we've already done to the um, RFP and information about the program um, so that you can refresh your memory on that if you missed it in the first time around. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, for sharing, that was really helpful. Oh, we just had two questions pop in, which is great. Mercedes, will Chase accept from other areas not mentioned, like St. Louis? Um, so we do have a full list, um, and I'm trying to quickly check if St. Louis is on the list. Um, but we, um, I, I don't think St. Louis is one of the eligible cities, um, but. I would just double check on our RFP eligible market list. Actually, yes, it is. Sorry, apologies. It is part of the eligible list. Great. And then um, that's a good point. Just to remind folks that, again, we'll send the link, but there is an eligible market list that may answer some of your questions. But um, are rural communities eligible or, or are they in the eligible list? I'm sorry, it's been a while since I've looked at it. It's okay. No, it's a it's a long list. <laughs> um, so yes, rural communities um, are as long as they're part of the list. So again, if you would just take a look at the um, full eligible markets list, um, we don't differentiate between um, you know rural and urban, but rural communities are definitely eligible. It just has to be on this list uh, that we have here. Great. And then one last question that's come in is. Um, for applications, do they need to include other CDFI collaboratives to be eligible? Um, yes. So as, as part of the requirements in the application are to list um, your CDFI partners. So it's really helpful to either have these informal partnerships or um, come together with new partners and put together the proposal together um, because we do ask for the other partners that you're putting together, either the planning grant or the capital grant on um, and who they are and um, your history working together or what their exact role will be in the collaborative. Great. Well, thank you for that. Um, I'm not seeing other questions come in, um, but we will also include Mercedes' contact information. So if something occurs to you, um, you can get in touch. Thanks. And again, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. And uh, we will share information, um, as I mentioned, in the follow-up email. But thank you, Mercedes. Yeah, thank you, guys. So now we're going to shift gears over to the National Community Stabilization Trust, and I'm going to, um, we have Julia Gordon, their Executive Vice President, Rob Grossinger, their President, and Rob Finn, who may all be uh, sharing with us today. Um, so I'm going to turn things over. Actually, Julia, are you going to drive slides? Do you have slides? there? I think there's technical difficulty. Here she is. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, I do have slides. All right. Then I will turn things over to you. Um, thank you so much. And uh, I appreciate this opportunity to present uh, 
to all of you guys, I know that you've heard from us before, and um, you'll probably hear from us again, uh, but that is because we do spend pretty much all of our time thinking about neighborhood stabilization. Uh, so, you know, this is just a great group to be with. What we want to do today uh, is twofold. Um, we have talked on this call before about NCST's basic um, <coughs> and structure. So there are two areas I want to do a deep dive into today, which is to talk about our policy agenda and also to talk about our work with the portfolio of non-performing loans. Um, but before I do that, I will spend one minute on just uh, the brief overview for anybody who may be new to the call or, or um, new to our organization. So the National Community Stabilization Trust, which was established in the wake of the housing crisis um, through a, a partnership between uh, some financial institutions that had REO and housing organizations that were interested in getting those REO properties into the hands of uh, local CDCs and other nonprofits that were going to um, rehab those REO and put them back into productive use in the community. Um, our model is probably best described as a social enterprise in that we use market mechanisms to try to achieve a neighborhood positive goal. We run a platform that's sort of like Zillow for CDCs, where uh, participating sellers of REO uh, put their properties onto our platform, and then CDCs can see those properties that are within their focus areas. Uh, and, and then there's a, a pricing process, and um, then, then the, the REO is sold to that, that local end user. Uh, NCST doesn't actually take title to these properties. We really just provide the technology platform and we're the, the matchmaker or the bridge between the financial institutions and the, the local organizations. Um, what we're going to talk about today is two programs that are not that core program that we run. Uh, one is that in the last few years, NCST has started to um, immerse itself in the policy arena and to try to be a voice for neighborhood stabilization, for vacant properties, um, and, you know, and for, for all of those things that not that many people think about when the property no longer has a homeowner in it. The other area we're going to talk about is the area where we do, in fact, own um, properties that are uh, you know, mostly vacant and in deep default. And we are working through that portfolio of properties to obtain the same kinds of neighborhood positive uh, end uses that we're trying to obtain through our REO sales operation. Um, I'm going to start by talking about policy. Uh, Rob Finn, who's our policy associate, is, is going to jump in um, a couple of times. And then uh, Rob Grossinger is going to focus on our uh, work with our, our non-performing portfolio. So it's a little weird to just present on here. And I know I can't say any questions at this point. So I'm just going to keep keep plowing ahead. I, I'm hoping everybody can see our slides. Yes, we can. OK. So I, I'm going to go through two slides on the policy front, one slide on recent accomplishments, and another slide on you know, agenda going forward. Um, and really what the purpose of my sharing this with you is not to provide uh, an advertisement for NCST, although that's always delightful, but um, to, 
to, to really lay out a fairly comprehensive policy agenda around you know, what we've previously called neighborhood stabilization. We're not sure that exactly remains the right term, but I think most of you on the call know what we mean. Um, and you'll see from this slide that it actually encompasses a fairly broad agenda. So some of the noteworthy activities from, from you know, the past year-ish, uh, I'm going to call on Rob Finn to talk first about something that I think was one of our bigger accomplishments um, that, you know, obviously none of these accomplishments were accomplished alone. Many of you on the phone have partnered with us on lots of these uh, initiatives. Um, but I, I'm going to turn it over now to, for Rob Finn to talk a little bit about FHFA's duty to serve and, and, that's, and the relationship with neighborhood stabilization. So Rob, do you want to take a minute for that? Thanks, Julia. Um, just to give some of the context of how we got involved in the duty to serve rulemaking, um, we, we commented at various junctures along the way. Uh, the first and I think one of the more important uh, things that we did was that we, we through our comment and through support from other organizations, uh, got FHFA to include a neighborhood stabilization activities in the list of um, eligible criteria for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to receive duty to serve credit in their underserved market plans. Um, the, unfortunately, Freddie did not take uh, FHFA up on that. However, Fannie Mae did. Uh, and we also uh, were heavily involved in the comments to the actual uh, proposed underserved market plans. Um, Fannie Mae's original plan uh, included some neighborhood stabilization activities. They were a bit uh, underwhelming in terms of the ambitious uh, or the, the lack of ambition with respect to the numbers of um, renovation loans that they were looking to uh, looking to receive credit for. So, uh, however, the outcome of their final plan, we were pretty uh, pleasantly surprised by how uh, thoughtful they were in the comment review from their proposal to their ultimate plan. That plan now includes uh, a lot of different areas front loaded with uh, a lot of research and sort of collaboration between financial institutions, CDFIs, uh, community development organizations like our buyers uh, to try and determine what the best way to meet the financial needs and the capital needs in the acquisition and rehab space is. So um, uh, they also have uh, uh, some more robust uh, acquisition and rehab loan purchase goals than from their original proposal. And uh, they looks like they're going to be doing some serious work to try and develop a product or uh, a, take a, a, another stab at making their current product, which really only works for individual home buyers, uh, work for nonprofit organizations to uh, obtain financing to acquire and rehab distressed single family properties. Thanks, Rob. Um, I, you know, since all of you are staring at your computer now, reading our slides, um, I don't want to just read through what's there in front of you, but I do want to highlight a couple of other things that we're involved with that some others of you are involved with and others of you could be involved with. Um, Uh, occupants participating in a number of different conversations uh, with respect to um, mortgages and disaster relief. 
Um, we've actually come to focus more recently, specifically on Puerto Rico, where we see a very, very slow recovery and a very significant impact on single family home ownership or potential impact. Um, so among other things that have been happening in that work stream are efforts, so far there's been a lot of success, efforts to um, improve the loan modification offerings for homeowners who have been hit by the hurricanes. Um, most recently, uh, to further extend some moratorium periods on foreclosures in those very hard hit areas, and trying to get a jump early before we are overwhelmed with kind of a post foreclosure REO glut to think about better ways than we've used before to both prevent vacancy and once vacancy occurs, to prevent you know, deterioration and loss of the property and to more quickly move those properties back into productive use. So those conversations are ongoing. I, I do feel like I should say to this group that um, while we anticipated FHFA would be a good partner, we've been very pleasantly surprised at how FHA has also been a good partner and seems um, very committed to to being creative and responsive in this area. Um, our, our next move is to go to the FDIC to see what they can do with respect to loan portfolios that are not neither GSE nor HUD portfolios. Um, another thing I want to just touch on in our policy agenda has to do with single family rental. Um, we have come to the conclusion through a variety of areas of our work that the um, really significant transfer of single family ownership from either owner occupants or local mom and pop landlords, either to you know sort of large institutional investors or just to it, you know, investors that are not in the community, absentee landlords, you know, maybe as far absentee as living in another country, you know, obviously China buys a lot of, um, a lot of properties in the U.S., um, as, as do some other countries. In the communities where we work, we see this um, absentee landlord problem, both the institutional and the individual flavors, as being a very significant problem and obstacle to uh, uh, not only getting the housing stock back in shape, but really getting the housing market working again properly, you know, getting market value comps and the like. And so we've been, we've been focused on a variety of different um, policy areas that, that touch on single family uh, whether it's, you know, how the GSEs are entering financing single family investors through their multifamily channel or, you know, what they're requiring of purchasers of their REO. Um, so, you know, if, if you're interested in these issues, we can talk more about that, too. And finally, um, while Rob Grossinger may want to talk about this more, we, we've really refocused on efforts to develop sources of capital for organizations engaged in single family acquisition and rehab. Uh, you know, as, as the more, uh, you know, the, the easier subsidy programs dry up um, or go away entirely in the case of NSP, um, this work still needs to be done. And we particularly believe that the CDFI community um, should, should consider developing more of an expertise uh, in, in this particular issue area. So I'm just gonna go to the next slide now, um, which is just some of the things we're, we're um, continuing to work on. Um, one of those projects is, we call the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act. This is a coalition effort. A number of you on the phone are part of this coalition to develop what's essentially a single family tax credit 
that supports construction and rehab work in distressed neighborhoods. Um, the support would go toward uh, basically closing what we call the appraisal gap, the difference in what it costs to build or rehab properties and the depressed price at which properties in those neighborhoods are selling. Um, you know, at some point we should probably do a whole presentation focused exclusively uh, on that proposal. But at this point, what I'll mainly say is if you're interested in the idea of some bringing investment into single family construction and rehab, much the way LIHTC brought private investment into rental housing, I'd suggest you go to a website called neighborhoodhomesinvestmentact.org and you can find lots more information there. Um, another thing that we're gonna do here at NCST in the next few months is publish a short report on how the so-called fast track foreclosure statutes are working. Um, those are efforts in various states to allow vacant homes to go through foreclosure more quickly in the hope that that will help prevent neighborhood blight. And Rob, do you want to say anything else about that? Um, uh, all I'll add is that uh, a lot of states that we have been taking a look at are um, the common theme we're finding is that uh, the data as to whether these fast track foreclosure statutes are making an impact um, is really hard to come by, if not impossible in some places. Uh, so uh, a, a large part of what we've been trying to uncover in our investigation, we've had to do through, um, through interviews with folks that practice foreclosure law, uh, judges, court staff, um, because it, there's really a big data black hole in most places. Um, thanks. And, you know, I'm not, I, we, we actually did finally start to be able to get some data just a little while ago when we were almost ready to publish our report. So now we're holding off while we explore the new information we've gotten. But I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that will be out fairly soon. Um, something else I want to uh, highlight off of this list of our current priorities that I haven't already talked about is small balance loans. You know, like many of you in many of the neighborhoods we work in, um, homes are quite affordable if only you can get a mortgage to buy them. And uh, this year, FHFA has put in its scorecard to Fannie and Freddie, and I think most of you know the scorecard, meeting scorecard uh, objectives affects the bonuses of Fannie and Freddie uh, executives, so they, they do tend to pay attention to it. Um, one of the scorecard items is to focus on ways to um, try to overcome the barriers to lenders making small balance loans. Um, you know, historically, I think people have thought of small balance loans as loans under 50,000, but, uh, you know, most folks report that it's problematic to get access to credit for anything under 100,000 in, in most places. Um, I've even heard from some CDFIs working in this area that they consider small, like for who, who try to cross subsidize some small balance loans that they, they really, uh, that 150 may, may be the right, the right cutoff there. Um, you know, this is a critical area to work in and it's so very embedded in the, in the current structure of how we do mortgage lending. Um, you know, I think it's, really challenging, but I think we're, we're at a moment where a number of factors are, are pushing different policymakers to take a look at it. So, you know, I'm hopeful that we, we can get some interesting stuff going. Um, I think I'm going to stop there in policy and Rebecca, I'll leave it up to you whether you want to um, allow any questions now before we go to talking about the portfolio stuff or uh, whether whether we should just keep plowing forward. 
let's keep moving so folks um, through the rest of your presentation and then we'll take questions at the end. Okay. Um, folks, as they occur to you, send them, send them through so we have them ready to, to dive into. Okay, so Rob Grossinger, I'm turning, turning the microphone over to you now. Uh, thanks, Julia. Uh, hi, everyone. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, non-performing loans, which is both sort of looked at in awe by some, looked at with desire by others, and looked at as how fast can I run away uh, from those things by other people. So let's talk a little bit about how we got into this. Um, and if you take a look at the first slide, what we're going to talk about is how we've seen the resolutions of our portfolio play out over time. And in celebration of next week's um, Pi Day, we have a pie chart for you. So we formed this entity called CRC um, back a couple of years ago with the Housing Partnership Network based on... The, uh, the basically we were approached by Goldman Sachs who said, we have some charge off notes, we'd like to get rid of them, would you like to take them, and maybe you should form an entity to do it. And so it was HPN and NCST deciding to form this entity. And as a result, we took a small amount of notes from Goldman Sachs and they were very, very delinquent and in very bad shape and tried to deal with them as best as possible. These were in Cleveland. That was sort of what it looked like would be the end of it until Bank of America approached us and said, gee, we need to meet the national mortgage settlement um, requirements, and maybe we can just give you all of these loans that we have charged off um, based on our wonderful purchase of Countrywide. And so as a result of that purchase, we've got all of these loans that are, we don't even know what to do with them, we don't know what their status is, and we could just give them to you. And luckily my predecessor, Craig Nickerson said, well, that's fine, but these are not only worthless, but they're gonna cost money. So you're gonna have to give us cash with those notes in order to dispose of them. And our staff went through a process of sort of trying to determine the price that it would cost us, the cost of doing that in terms of resolving all of these notes. So as opposed to bidding on a portfolio and trying to determine what your residual value will be and then bidding that amount saying, I can make this much money and pay back money if I'm borrowing to make the purchase. In this case, we were saying, you have to give us these notes and give us all these cash, all this cash. So what I wanted to do today for you is just talk about what's happened with those approximately 1300 notes. There are still about 500 that are active Quite a few of those, if you look at the um, at the chart, we lost, we didn't have any ownership of them from the get-go. Um, it turned out that Bank of America didn't own them when they thought they did, when they gave them to us. They had been lost to tax sale a year or two years or three years before. We've had a lot of situations in which Bank of America didn't have the senior lien, so it didn't matter that they thought they were giving us something. They couldn't give it to us because it was a junior lien. And uh, there was someone else in the senior lien position. It was just, you know, part of that purchase of Countrywide that um, Bank of America ended up with all of these assets that they really didn't even know what their legal status was. So that creamed at least 300 notes right off the top in terms of there was nothing for us to do with them. They were either already gone or we had no legal right to do anything with them. So as you start to look at the rest of the distribution, we assumed that all of these notes were vacant properties. There was never really an assumption that many of them had an occupant. We thought some did. We certainly didn't go and look at every property uh, before it was given to us. We didn't go and view 1,300 properties across the entire country, by the way. We even had one in Montana. Um, so we were just assuming based on whatever due diligence we could that these were vacant. It turned out that there were owner occupied properties. So if you look at the chart on the left next to the pie chart, you can see that we have done some loan modifications wherever we could reach a borrower. We tried to do either a loan modification or a settlement. Um, 
If they have no money whatsoever, but they want to stay in the home, we just release our lien and give them the house. Uh, again, the, the, the economics of this is totally different than if we were to have had to purchase these and use debt or equity to purchase these notes. So as you look at the, the chart on the left, the average modification brought the unpaid principal balance down to around 12,500. So significant reduction. We were doing a, uh, basically setting the UPB on average at around 25% of what it was before the property went into foreclosure. Um, we didn't really pay attention at all to the um, broker's price opinion value. We really were more interested in, is this something they could afford? Was 25% of um, UPB okay for them to be able to afford? We did not do any kind of big analysis in the way that you were required to do under any of the other loan modification programs because we didn't care about the economics. We just wanted the person to be able to stay in their home. Some borrowers wanted to just get out from under and settle and would give us three or $5,000 to settle it. Some settled on a modification. Our game plan by mid to late 2019 is to release all of those. We're not gonna try and sell those notes to somebody else. Uh, that is a strategy when you're buying notes is to get them to perform for a few years and either get them refinanced or sell them. In this case, we're just gonna say, as we're closing this portfolio down, congratulations, you've been performing for a while. Even if you haven't been performing for a while, here's your house. Um, again, that's the luxury we have because these were donations along with cash. I think what's been surprising to us is the level of issues that come up on a property when you own the note, let alone after you foreclose and own the REO. Uh, there are municipalities, and rightly so, that take vacant properties seriously. They take um, unpreserved vacant properties very seriously. So we are getting constant notifications from municipalities about, hey, the back door has been kicked in, something's got to happen. We recently had uh, the president of, of this entity, CRC, is actually Tom Bledsoe, who runs, uh, as you, many of you know, runs HPN. He just got an arrest warrant issued for him for uh, a door being open in the back of a house that we didn't know because you only look at these properties once a month. So that obviously upset Tom, especially since he's on leave of absence. But again, those sort of things make this, when you're talking about low value properties, properties in bad condition, properties that no one is really cares about or did care about, they become much more work. And that work is a constant sense of stress between our staff and our servicer staff, because this is not, you've all heard all of the discussions around what it's like to service a, a delinquent portfolio, a portfolio that has gone through periods of delinquency. And, and you've heard servicers talk about that's why we need 75 basis points instead of 25 basis points to service this. It isn't, from a cost standpoint, that may all be true. But my warning to all nonprofits, and I get approached almost weekly from nonprofits who say, hey, I want to get into that note purchasing space, is you have no idea what you're asking for. You have no idea the level of minutia that can get thrown in your face about a property that you're trying to do the right thing for. So uh, again, taking a look at the active box, um, we have some uh, homeowners who've gone into bankruptcy. Some of those are paying as a result, while it's in bankruptcy court, some are not. Again, our goal will be to check with the homeowners. Right now, we're, we're restricted. We can't talk to them because it's in bankruptcy. We've tried reaching out to the attorneys. If they want to stay in the house, we'll just give them the house. Um, you see the modifications and the foreclosures. Foreclosures, we anticipate to be the largest by far outcome of these properties because there's nobody there. There's nobody even to find. Um, and then you can see what we're doing, where if we can get a deed in lieu of foreclosure from someone, again, the first offer is, are you interested? Those eight deed in lieus, those people don't live in the property anymore. In many cases, they don't even live in the state. They don't have anything to do with the property. And they're willing for a, a cash settlement to just sign over the deed to us instead of us having to go through foreclosure. Um, and then we're beginning more of a process of releasing liens. That's what the ROL is. On the inactive side, those are just ones that we've closed out. 
You can see how many REOs we've liquidated, how many settlements, senior lien sale, invalid lien. Those are all the ones that Bank of America had no idea what was going on with them and thought they were giving us something they owned when in fact they didn't. The other area that is of concern to me long term in this area of note sales, and by the way, this business of note sales has been going on for over 30 years. Um, there's always been a trading of delinquent notes between financial institutions and investors who like to buy them. <coughs> it simply took a much higher profile after the housing crisis in 2008. The easiest, most economical, and least headache uh, approach to dealing with a problem property of very low value is just to leave it be and let hopefully it'll be sold but its taxes will be sold at a municipal tax foreclosure sale or the municipality will take it or it'll just get out of your hands the problem with that is it just shifts the burden to the municipality to have to deal with it it shifts the burden to the community to have to deal with a vacant property uh, which is deteriorating in most cases and it's not a good outcome. But if I'm running a business, which is I bought a bunch of economic choice when it comes to how to deal with these, because by going through foreclosure and then trying to sell the property, I'm going to lose money. And so I'd rather have the, the, the city just take it or the municipality just take it in tax foreclosure. What you see there are ones that happened, again, before we even took ownership of them. They have been lost by Bank of America or... We have, and this is, this is the one uh, bright spot when it comes to municipal tax foreclosures, we've reached agreement with a few land banks and their municipalities where the municipality takes it via tax foreclosure and then donates it to the land bank. What we do is we take whatever capital we had um, assigned to that particular node. And when we did this with Bank of America, we actually had a number for all 1,300 notes, how much cash they were giving us for each one. And we give that to the land bank to either rehab the property or demolish it. And uh, you don't see demolition listed as an outcome here, but we anticipate probably 150 of these properties are going to be demolished by the time we're all said and done at an average of about 16,000. You'll see that on the next slide when we get there, which will be very soon, Julia. Yeah. Um, so, no, I just wanted to make sure you, you were awake. So anyway, that's those are the things that I worry about when I think about this asset class, which is that the economics drive you as a business person to a bad outcome in many cases. Luckily, we don't have to reach those bad outcomes because we are, um, we're financed enough. We, we received enough capital from Bank of America. I had no idea what that was. Um, we, uh, we receive enough capital to do these um, in a way that that does reach a good community outcome. I will say the last thing uh, before we go to the next slide, we just entered into a partnership with New Jersey Community Capital and Hogar Hispano to bid on, and we won a recent pool of non-performing loans that Fannie Mae sold, ended up being in the high 400s in terms of notes. Our role, NCST's role, is really just focused on the vacant properties. We don't have a network to do borrower outreach or borrower counseling. So we are going to be asset managers of those assets in certain markets that the borrower cannot be saved, is either not around or doesn't want to be saved. And therefore, um, we're gonna work on moving the property through foreclosure. We have a waterfall of what to do with that property once we own the REO. And uh, at some point in that waterfall, it will go through our first look program. But that's our niche, is dealing with vacant properties and dealing with um, land banks and municipalities and other entities who've really worked through good agreements on how to deal with these low value properties so that they don't just rot within some community's tax foreclosure system. I live in Chicago. We have a horrible system where um, people will buy tons and tons of tax certificates. They'll just sit on those properties to see if the value goes up or not, never pay taxes on them, and they'll just lose them again back to the next tax sale. And it's the worst possible thing for communities. You want to go to the next one? Julia? There we go. This is just to give you a sense of, of the different costs, both how much we've spent 
um, in terms of disposing of these assets, but the averages. And this comes up a lot when groups call me and they'll say, well, how much are you paying for this or how much are you paying for that? So I just put this in here for you. I don't re really need to go through it, except again, I want to highlight the demolition costs. We that's pretty close to what we had estimated. It varies based on um, who's doing it, where it's happening. We've gotten bids as high as thirty, forty thousand. I'm trying, I'm trying to keep things in terms of the same square footage, uh, and then we'll find another somebody else who'll do it for fifteen or sixteen. Um, municipalities charge more than if we hire, so we tend to. It's usually our preference to retain the vendor and do the demolition ourselves, as opposed to having the municipality do it. Land banks are actually do it fairly economically. Um, the other issue with these, this particular portfolio, because it was so mysterious to Bank of America, some of these properties had $100,000 back tax bills. Um, and we asked for that amount of money from Bank of America. Sometimes they gave it to us, sometimes they chose not to uh, transfer that particular asset. And you know, our goal was to pay off the back taxes and move it to distribution or uh, disposition. I'm sorry. Again, if the local land bank and municipality had a deal, we could do it that way. If we had the capital in that particular assets account, we then just transferred that to the local group to be able to rehab or demolish the property when they were done. So uh, I guess the, the moral of this story is there's been a movement for the last few years among nonprofits especially to get into the note space because the ARIO portfolios are dwindling, single family homes in general, the competition as Julie men Julia mentioned, we're having institutional investors outbidding everybody else um, and single family in many communities is shifting the community culture from home ownership to rental. But this is not for the faint of heart. Um, I had a conversation with a nonprofit the other day who didn't even realize you had to have a separate servicer to deal with notes if you bought them. Um, so it's it's something, and we act, we actually directly contract with a few vendors because our servicers are so bad because, quite frankly, all servicers are bad. So for the foreclosure network and the property preservation work and the custodial work on the documents, we contract directly with vendors because we every time we relied on the servicer, it would get screwed up. So that's, in a sense, my little pitch about CRC. I think there will continue to be nonprofit involvement in the purchase of notes. There will continue to be note sales by Fannie, Freddie, and FHA. We'll probably get back into the ballgame soon. And being a counterbalance to these large investors who are buying these, but also the work that Julia and Rob do, which is to try and get the seller, meaning Fannie, Freddie, or FHA, to put a good set of guardrails around this, the use of those notes, meaning whatever the outcome is going to be, so that one of the things we argued for and, and got successfully was the no walk away. You can't just buy a note, decide it's too expensive to deal with, and release your lien and walk away. So that's those are the kinds of advocacy things that we have to keep doing because we'll never have the money that the institutional investors have. We'll never have billions of dollars to invest in this. But if we can provide a counterbalance uh, in some way and also demand that whoever is the purchaser follow a set of rules, we'll have made some headway. And we already have. And that's it. Rebecca, I turn it back to you or to Julia or to anyone else who wants to be on. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, that was really informative and um, I think highlights that while the crisis may be over, generally speaking, you know, the runoff of, of what it left behind is, is not only still there, but incredibly complicated still to sift through. Um, and it, it's good to keep that in mind when we're thinking about this. Um, we do have one question from the group so far. Um, you guys are in a certain number of markets. You've recently expanded. Um, but can you give folks a sense of kind of the size of municipalities you're working with, especially around, um, you mentioned the tax foreclosures and the note sales, like that particular piece? Um, I can go ahead and answer that, or Julia, we, we are in, for the NSI program, which is the one in which we are transacting Fannie and uh, 
let's just stay with Fannie for a second, Fannie Mae REOs. That's 28 markets, which range from smaller cities in a few like Orlando and Jacksonville in Florida, St. Louis, Kansas City, Milwaukee, Indianapolis, to Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland. Um, basically, it's all the markets you would think it would be west, uh, east of the Mississippi, except St. Louis which and Kansas City, which are west of the Mississippi. It doesn't go any farther west than that. Um, where we're dealing with note purchases, that was national from Bank of America um, with the pool that we bought with NJCC and Hogar, we picked 10, nine markets and said, these are nine markets that we have relationships with. And we'd like to buy notes in those markets. And those are, interestingly enough, Portland, Oregon, uh, and then Milwaukee, uh, and then the ones you would anticipate, Chicago, uh, a number in Florida, a number of in New Jersey. But that's where those were. There's some, in, there's very few, there's hardly anything left in Phoenix or California, just because um, investors have been picking those clean for years. And I'll give folks so another minute to see if there's more questions. Um, you mentioned uh, the the guardrails when entities like Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac lenders sell off some of these notes. And and the guardrails are new in the sense that before the crisis, we weren't having huge sell-offs of properties and notes. Um, do you have a sense, are we kind of in a better place permanently? I'm, I'm searching for the right word, but do we have a framework that's going to be in place if, heaven forbid, we face another foreclosure crisis? where we don't have to fight these battles a second time? Um, well, I, I, I'm going to answer that in two different areas. Um, first of all, in terms of mortgage servicing and the loss mitigation options available to us, we are in a significantly better place than we were at the inception of the crisis. Um, we have a fairly uh, you know, robust menu of options at this point that servicers can use, ranging from some um, you know, uh, fairly, from, from loan modifications that are not kind of one-offs, but that are um, used widely and therefore can be understood widely, along with much more rules-based approaches to things like short sales, deeds in lieu, um, and you know uh, other other kinds of um, non-foreclosure alternatives. <laughs> On the note sales side, yeah. the the all that's been put in place is has been done at the. Uh, not even, you know, it's it's not legislation and it's not even regulation, although FHA has been told by their IG that they actually have to go through APA rulemaking um, with respect to the, the distressed asset sales, um, which they are proceeding, albeit at their usual not so rapid pace of rulemaking to do. On the FHFA side, you know, it's just um, guidelines put out by the current um, director that could be changed at any moment, either by the current director or by any successor. So these are going to be issues that we're going to have to keep uh, very much abreast of as things move forward. The good news is we've had some learning and we've been able to raise awareness so that I don't think that either FHA or FHFA will as easily in the future just start selling things off with no rules at all as they both did when they started selling, do, doing the bulk auctions of notes post-crisis. Thanks, Leigh. That's a really helpful distinction between um, thinking about the note sales versus REOs. Um, I want to I want to wrap up so we can get to Michael's presentation. But two quick things, if you can answer them quickly. Um, one, 
is does NCST have a listserv or a way folks can kind of keep track of, of what you're doing and how things are evolving? And then two, again, briefly, any breast practices you found in terms of working with municipalities on these property issues? Well, I'll quickly answer the first one, which is we have a monthly newsletter, which you can sign up for, and we have a website um, that we keep updated. And if you are, if you become one of our buyers, you then receive regular emails um, when REOs are available. And Rob, I'll let you answer the second question. Yeah, I would just say uh, on that best practices, first of all, it makes it much easier when there already are communications and there already is a relationship between a local land bank and a municipality. But where we had to start those conversations, it's appealing to their economic best interest. You know, this is, if you will work with us, you won't just end up with this asset that is going to cost you all the money that we have some capital we can provide to you. This will also move things quicker, quicker, get this thing back on the tax rolls quicker. So it's, a, it's appealing to the municipality's economic interest first. Then you do a little of the song and dance about how this is good for the community. But what we found is that first and foremost, you have to talk to them about money that it will save them um, because they are all understaffed in the building code enforcement area. They're all understaffed in being able to do demolitions and underfunded. And, and they just feel under siege as it is when it comes to vacant, blighted properties. No, I think that's a great point. Um, I think they do feel under siege. Um, and there have been municipalities, uh, I know, that have tried to get more efficient or streamlined around code enforcement, but it's a difficult, a difficult problem to solve. Uh, so with that, I want to thank all of you for, for that presentation. That was so, so helpful and um, valuable to give a sense of this space um, that we do need to keep revisiting um, going forward. Um, so if folks have questions, we will share contact information and you can follow up offline after the webinar. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn things over to Michael. Let me just pull up his slides. Okay, where's that for you? Okay. Well, thanks, everyone. Uh, hopefully, you can you can hear me. Uh, and thanks to Rob and Julia. We're excited. Uh, I enjoyed your presentation, and we're excited to have NCST uh, doing doing work in Milwaukee. And hopefully, we're going to be able to uh, to do to do a fair amount of um, collaboration uh, here. Uh, so my name is Michael Gossman. Uh, I'm the executive director of of Ax Housing. We're a a grassroots group uh, operating uh, operated out of the city of Milwaukee over the last um, almost 25 years, uh, and it's a pleasure to be able to just share a little bit of of the approach that we've taken to helping families become homeowners. And look forward to the discussion and any ideas or thoughts that um, all of you have. So let's get to it. Um, So um, it will not come as a surprise to any of you that uh, the rental market uh, is, uh, has some challenges, especially in Milwaukee. Uh, I imagine uh, everyone on the call is familiar with Matt Desmond's book, Evicted. Uh, I'm sure many of you have read it. Um, as a practitioner working in the city of Milwaukee, having a, a bestseller that talks about the um, eviction crisis uh, across the country, and in particular in our city, was... Um, uh, I guess uh, both a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing in that it's drawn a lot of attention to this issue uh, and brought some resources to the types of work we like to do. Uh, but it's also sad that, you know, we've been doing this work for 25 years and uh, the city that, uh, that I live in uh, is still really struggling. So um, some statistics, a lot of which are, are from uh, Matt Desmond's book, um, 16,000 adults and children are evicted uh, every year in Milwaukee. Uh, and one out of five rental households in, in the country as a whole uh, spends half of their income on housing. Uh, and what we've seen both locally and nationally is that rental prices have increased, uh, but incomes have not. So uh, at Axe, we work with um, the same families that are struggling to be able to afford to consistently pay their rent 
and we work with them to help them transition to become uh, successful homeowners. Uh, we do this uh, really by uh, partnering with families and providing four key uh, services. So, um, and none of these services are, are unique to us, so I think the way we've put them together is, is quite unusual, especially in a, in a distressed market like the one we're operating in. Uh, so first, we're a HUD-approved home buyer and financial counseling uh, agency. Uh, we work with families. We um, take them wherever they're at in the process and help them put an action plan in place and um, take the steps necessary to prepare for ownership. Uh, that ownership could be a bank, uh, bank finance transaction, uh, or it could be uh, purchasing a distressed home for cash and fixing it up using their own resources. Um, and my slide just advanced without a... Uh, uh, there's a phantom advance. Uh, now it's advanced a few. <laughs> sure thanks, thanks, thanks for the assist. I don't know. Okay, all our families have been through our, our counseling program and are pre-approved either for a bank loan or to purchase a home uh, for cash using um, our own uh, internal financing. Um, then they almost always work with one of our realtors. So we're a nonprofit real estate brokerage. Uh, we have four realtors on our staff that um, are working with families that are um, a very modest income. Often our families have, have language or cultural or other barriers that might make it difficult for them to find an agent that wants to represent them in their purchase, especially since the homes they're buying are often extremely uh, low priced. Um, a, a typical transaction might be purchasing a home from the city of Milwaukee for $3,500. So there aren't necessarily the right incentives in place for a, a vibrant um, buyer side real estate environment. So we have um, four realtors on our team that are representing families. Uh, and if, they, if they're going the route where they want to purchase a home that requires a lot of rehab, uh, we, we don't do the rehab for families, but we have a team of rehab counselors that works with those families to put together a scope of work, help them understand what a home needs, and then is with them throughout their rehab journey. Uh, we're not a general contractor. We're really just a coach. So the family owns the home, but we help them make sure they don't make missteps. We help them solicit bids. When work's done, we help them uh, make sure that they're getting what they paid for. Uh, and that's a big help to, to families, especially those that might not, you know, have, have done a project like this or, or have, any, have had any familiarity with rehab uh, prior to working with our program. And then uh, the last piece, which is sort of our newest uh, effort, is that we, we are a lender. Um, we have an affiliated nonprofit entity that lends money to the families that are purchasing homes for cash and that need uh, rehab uh, financing. But we are talking about really small mortgages. So our biggest loans currently are $25,000. And, um, and we have a portfolio of uh, approximately 100 of those loans that are in various stages of, of repayment. Uh, I'm going to try and move to the next slide. Okay, so this is an example of, of one family, just to give you a sense of how this works, because I think, especially since many of you on the phone might be uh, calling in from communities that have a very different uh, real estate market than we have in Milwaukee. Uh, so, so this is an example. It involves uh, Ashley, who uh, bought a home through our program. She's a nursing assistant. Um, uh, only part-time. She has um, two young children. Uh, and she came to us uh, at a time when she had a, a, a significant tax refund. So she had a fair amount to invest of her own money in the program. Yeah, I'm um, not sure if they're not decided. I'm having them, but... Pay at the end of the five years, she owns the home free and clear. There's no more debt on the property. And so her housing costs um, at that point is just the taxes, insurance, and maintenance of the home. Can we move to the next slide? So we just we do deals one 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 by one. Um, we we tend to have a geographic focus, as you'll see on the subsequent slide. But it's about helping families um, find the home that's right for them that they can afford, uh, and preparing them for success. So uh, over our 21-year uh, history since incorporation, we actually were working even before we were incorporated. So we've got a few more years, uh, even than it says there, sustainable. So let's move to the next. Um, so the next slide just gives you a visual picture of, of where our homes are. Um, they're, they're throughout the city of Milwaukee. 
And the next slide just deals with the families have been successful in their home ownership. Um, we define success as um, uh, we sold them uh, or they um, sold it in a voluntary uh, transaction. So 6% uh, have experienced a, a foreclosure. Um, but given that we're working with families that are typically earning about half the county median income uh, and pretty near the, the poverty line in Milwaukee, um, we think that the sustainability our families have achieved is, is significant and is worth talking about and is likely far better than they would have done if they were in the rental market. Um, and uh, just one more word about our sustainability. So our loan program, as I mentioned before, we have 100 loans. Uh, these are to families that fall outside of bank's lending criteria. But because of the counseling that we do with the families, because we're helping them get a really good deal, because we um, are helping them through the rehab, and then because of the relationship we, de we develop with the homeowner, our portfolios always performed quite well. So um, anywhere from 97 to 99 of those loans have been current at any given time uh, over the last two years. Um, and we're hopeful that that can continue even as we're able to lend larger amounts of money uh, and, um, and, and have a, a greater loan volume than we currently do. And so that takes us to our last slide, uh, which is a picture of my, our, my longtime colleague, Balia Cha. And um, you know we were uh, at a, a team meeting uh, and, and there was a lot of uh, gnashing of teeth over some of the challenges we were seeing and um, a lot of excuses and frustrations. And Balia, uh, who personally has worked with around 600 families, uh, many of them refugees, uh, helping them purchase homes in, in Milwaukee, came out with this gem that I don't know if it's actually um, uh, of Hmong origin as Balia is, or if it just is, is something she invented on the spot. But she said, if you're a flower, you don't wait for the good soil, you just grow. And I think that's sort of the approach that our whole team has to um, partnering with families and helping them improve their lives. And uh, it's awesome to be able to do this work. And uh, I'm grateful to, for the chance to uh, talk with all of you. And if anyone has any questions, I certainly would love to, uh, to hear them. Thanks so much, Michael. That was such a great overview of your program. And as folks are thinking of questions, I have one that you, you kind of alluded to this in your last few remarks, but um, where are you hoping to go? You mentioned kind of growing your portfolio or, or either in number of loans or size of loans, but kind of what's your next next step or next thing that you're looking at? Well, there's a huge market in Milwaukee that we're still not touching. So we may help 150 families in a year to become homeowners, but it's clear to us that there's enough, both enough supply and enough demand that if we can better connect those things and make our program more efficient, that we can help a lot more families. Um, so uh, I think we can do a lot more here. Uh, at the same time, uh, there have been other municipalities that approach us from time to time about either you know, uh, us um, supporting their efforts in some way or potentially, especially those that are close to Milwaukee, us considering expanding our efforts. And so we're, we enjoy having those conversations and thinking about how we can do more. Uh, you know, we were, we were operating out of a church basement uh, three and a half years ago uh, with a staff of seven. And so um, we, we've had some, some growing pains as we try and uh, provide a more consistent, better uh, service to families, to more families, but to do so while retaining sort of what we think made us special, which was this connection we really had to the community. And so we think a lot more is possible and clearly capital is a big piece of that. So there's no way we're gonna do a lot more unless we get better at um, lending so, some larger amounts of money and, and doing it sustainably. And so right now, one of our big challenges, um, we're not yet a CDFI is determining um, how to access the right type of patient capital to help us grow um, and, and thinking about you know, whether um, becoming a CDFI makes sense and on what, what timetable. No, that's great, um, and it is, it is expansion is a process, so it's good to remind us all of that. We can't just flip the switch. Um, we did have a question come in. In your current model, how are you covering your operations costs? Is it through the, 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 the loan portfolio or, or fundraising, or, or kind of what's your organizational sustainability model? Absolutely. So. Um, so our loan program is right now a small, small part of what we do. Um, it has a small, small budget, um, but um, it still needs to be subsidized uh, because uh, the, the interest that we can earn on a $25,000 loan 
doesn't cover the cost of compliance and servicing and all the other things that we're doing. Um, so our, our total organizational budget's around uh, $2 million, and the vast majority of that is philanthropy. Um, we, we, earn, we earn about 30 cents of every dollar we need to operate from um, mainly the real estate fees that we generate, but also the counseling fees and um, some rehab and, and interest income. Uh, but right now we're quite dependent on philanthropy. Um, we have found that when we tell our when we tell our story and when we get an opportunity to tell our story, that there's a lot of uh, folks who want to support. And so most, really, all of our supports coming from foundations, corporations, and individuals. We um, historically have had um, anywhere from none to extremely little uh, by way of government support. Thanks, Michael, that's helpful. And another question, um, what are you seeing in terms of, of value ranges once you, for the homes that do rehab? Um, if they acquire it for 3,500, in the example you, you cited, what's the after rehab feel? Yeah, so that's, it's, it's a good question. Um, you know, if you look at a home where there's an all-in investment of around $30,000, um, any home that's occupy that's occupiable and in de decent shape in in Milwaukee, it's it's probably it's it's worth at least forty. So there's a big range, but we believe uh, families pretty typically have some significant equity from the moment the home is is fixed up. Um, that's partly because we're we're getting the homes for them, we're getting them good deals. We get some dis we get some. Uh, donated properties to our program on occasion. Um, the city offers homes at a discount um, through us to the families that we work with. And partly because um, financing sources are so difficult for them to come by that there's a lot, of, um, a, a lot of sweat work that they're putting in. And so while they are pretty quickly capturing, we believe, a significant amount of equity, I, calling it free would not, be, would not be correct. I mean, there's a huge amount of sacrifice that families are putting into these transactions. So uh, we believe they're earning every every dollar of equity that they have, um, but we're not super smart on the equity piece. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you that uh, our families that come to us, I wish this wasn't the case, but equity is normally not one of the t one of the top reasons they come. And they really come because they're looking to have control of the environment they live in, to have it be safe, and to have it be more affordable. Um, and the fact that they can pay off their loan and own a home free and clear in somewhere between five and 10 years um, is, is, is interesting and down the, down the line. Um, and even farther down the line of that is, well, how much can I sell it for when it comes time to sell? Um, so over 25 years, our, our average family has, uh, over, over 25 years, 77% of our families still live in the same home we sold them. So depending on how you look at it, that's either an incredible accomplishment um, that they've maintained home ownership or um, somewhat distressing that they haven't been able to move on to that next, that next home, which frankly I think is, is because of the, the, their incomes not, not growing in the way that you would, hope, um, you would hope they would. That's really helpful. And it's good to think about when we're reaching different vulnerable populations for homeownership, low-income homeowners, but understanding motivation and what's driving their decision is really important when we are designing programs. Um, so getting a few more questions, but I want to be respectful of people's time, so we'll just do one last one, um, and then I will um, send these to, to Michael offline. But do you put any deed restrictions on the house or affordability requirements? Yes, great question. So uh, for all the homes that we're um, accessing at a, a discount or when we're financing the transaction, there's a five-year owner occupancy restriction. Uh, and we'll, um, we will enforce that restriction, though, if someone uh, moves and sells to another owner occupant, um, that restriction will just pass along to them for the remainder of the term. Uh, and we, um, we found that that's pretty successful and it is very rare for a family prior to the five years to um, want to move for any reason. But when that does happen, we've been able to work it out where another owner occupant is purchasing the home and, and the family 
uh, who initially bought it is able to able to cash out. Great. Yeah. Um, I know that's something that's come up that came up with Habitat houses um, during the crisis was that they ended up refinancing out of their Habitat loan. Um, so they didn't leave the home; they're still owner-occupied, but they they didn't understand um, what they were trading off. Hmm. So having some some parameters to get folks stable in home ownership, I think, is a good idea. Um, so. Unfortunately, we are getting questions, but it's 3.25 and I don't want to hold folks past 3.30. So um, I, I'm taking notes on the questions we're not able to get to and we'll follow up with folks. Um, I just want to thank all of our presenters. I want to thank everyone who attended today and we will be reconvening mm -hmm. um, monthly as we do, uh, April 4th, to discuss naturally occurring affordable housing. We've got some great speakers lined up for you. Um, so. Stay tuned for more information on that. And with that, I will release you back into your day. Thanks so much, everyone. How many people?